This is Impressionism. Nice, isn't it? We find ourselves in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. We see miles and miles of medium-sized arrangements of delectable, charming colours. A total absence of darkness and a happy, woozy, soft-edgedness everywhere. How could anyone have ever hated this? Impressionism is the first movement of modern art. Because of its charm, we forget that Impressionism is also avant-gardism. We think Impressionism was the last time art was understandable, and then there's a succession of more and more outrageous hoaxes getting higher and higher into obscurity. And that's the modern art tradition that we're still in. But actually, this is in the same stream as this. We find the shark a bit mysterious, but we pretty much know what goes into its shock value. It's us, what we are, our society, what turns us on, what makes us react. We think this is too nice for that. What I'm going to do over the next two hours is tell the story of Impressionism partly in order to see what made this shocking in its time, but also to look at the challenge it offers to our equivalent of it. Tonight, Impressionism bites back. The two artists who opened the door for Impressionism are Gustave Courbet and Edouard Manet. They stand for the lead-up phase. The one quintessential Impressionist is Claude Monet. He starts up the movement. The artist who turned Impressionism into modern art is Paul Cézanne. He's the one who makes Impressionism's niceness complicated. These will be our guides for the evening. They all knew each other, they sometimes bought each other's paintings. They went to the same restaurants and encouraged each other, or gossiped and complained about each other. It's like a family in a soap opera, only instead of an oil dynasty, it's an art family with its own distinct culture. What unites them artistically is a radical idea. They think art should be real and not false. We think that too. Only we have certain fixed ideas about what reality is. Reality is literal and numb. An artist casts his head in his own frozen blood. Reality is politics that seem almost alien. So the alienating, sophisticated playfulness of today's political art almost makes sense. Reality now is a big confusion about beliefs. So instead of being hungry for the old moral certainties of the culture of art, its grand ambitions to tell us all how to be, we're hungry for personality, for confession, for glamorous individualism. Weirdly, the story of what Impressionism thought reality was begins with something like a Turner Prize installation. Paris, the 19th century. The first step toward Impressionism is a colossal event. The public can't miss it. It's called the Pavilion of the Real. The Pavilion of the Real was put up here in the centre of Paris in 1855, 150 years ago, by Courbet. Opposite is the biggest show of French art there's ever been. But Courbet is a rebel attacking the establishment. There's a big building full of official art, and across the road, a rebel in a tent. Here's a sketch by Courbet of how he wanted the pavilion to look. This scribble was to shake up art forever. 
hundreds of thousands of visitors went to the Universal Exhibition, which is what the official art show was called. Here it is. And then they went to Corbet's Pavilion. What did they see? Inside it were 40 paintings he'd done over the previous seven years. Most were large, some enormous, like this one, nearly 20 feet wide. It's called the Painter's Studio. On the left are veiled portraits of government people, the Emperor Napoleon III and other high-ups in the government. The Emperor is shown as a poacher because he stole the empire. Napoleon III seized power illegally in a coup d'etat. He had his enemies executed or exiled. His government is run as a dictatorship. Corbet said these are all just commercial people, shopkeepers. They have to be disguised here because no one can openly criticize the government. No one can put themselves against the emperor. The painting is an allegory of society. Over here is where the arty people of society are. In the middle of this little crew is Proudhon, the anarchist, who said, property is theft. On the left is the industrialist and art collector, Bruya, whose money paid for the pavilion of the real. It's a bit narcissistic because Corbet's at the center of it, his handsome Assyrian profile, he called it. He's definitely vain, but he's also realistic. The reason it's so big is because it's got to fight a big institution, the one that has the ultimate say over what art is, and that is the Salon of Fine Art held every year at the Louvre. Think of the Turner Prize, the Royal Academy Summer Show and the government all mixed up into a single totalizing entity. It's been going for centuries, now it answers direct to the emperor. Everything in it supports the emperor by supporting the idea that art should not be about the reality of what's actually happening now, but what happened long ago in an unreal, idealized, fictional time. The salon is an institution, but it's also a state of mind. Going to it shows your social aspiration. The atmosphere of salon art is always dead the people are anemic, anatomically perfect, but smoothed and varnished to death. Everything is done to a formula, according to conventions which are learned by artists like recipes. The frank colour in Impressionism, the directness of the paint handling, the open, loose, rough look to the way it's done, is the opposite to the overcooked look of salon art. You can see this kind of art reeling in horror from the Impressionist kind, the ordinary life kind, where the mundane is made special. In our time now, all visual media, high art, TV, movies, ads, whatever, start out from the mundane. They emphasize the everyday. This is our pop world today. It's a heaven of the ordinary, not a heaven of the heavenly. The human, the obvious, the down to earth, that's the stuff we elevate into art, whether it's Turner Prize art or mass media pop culture art. This is us, our own needy, human, childish, consuming selves. But in the 19th century, art was expected to transcend the everyday. Why be down in grim reality when you can be up here in the perfume clouds? Don't think about your real selves in real society being oppressed by a real dictator. Think about your fantasy selves off in an unreal classical theme park. As a salon favorite, you glorified the past with pageantry and teasing nudity and ancient Roman evoking. You weren't interested in reality. The real as merely immediate, raw, unfiltered life experience was not true, but merely random. Corbet thought this wasteland of the real had something, and maybe truth wasn't up in the air, but down to earth. He himself came from a place in the countryside that no one had ever heard of, the village of Ornan in eastern France. He came from a family of farmers. His father was a peasant who'd done well and acquired land and a couple of houses. 
The main family home was on the side of the river that ran through the centre of the village. Here is his house. Imagine the lovely, welcoming kitchen parlour inside. How's he going to get from that rustic, charming humbleness to being accepted by the glam salon power world? 